Hope everybody, everybody's excited for today's meeting. And we will, once our three instructors kind of get settled down, we'll go ahead and go over our first class, Investing 101, kind of just basic investing. If uh, a lot of y'all raise a hand, kind of new to investing, you know, like I kind of know what a stock is, kind of know what a bond is. Anybody? Raise your hands, kind of just, you know, nothing, no problem with this, right? We're here to learn. Okay, now let's get started. So go ahead and sign in on the QR code. Jot your attendance. Please do remember to use the same first and last name, as well as with the spaces. You don't want to add an extra space because then we'll have trouble kind of following that and finding, finding you when we go to our end of the year kind of raffle. Hope everybody's class has been going well as well. We're in the, what, third week, fourth week almost? Third week, yeah. Almost having those midterms come up from behind us. Get an RKO us. So today's general meeting agenda. We're going to go over some outperforming moments. Then we're going to go to our main presentation, Investing 101 with Nathan Lara. We also have the two associates, Luke and Sebastian. And then, of course, the sweet spot. So now, quick show of hands. Anybody have an outperforming moment this week that happened to them? Uh, they got to bed early in time before their alarm clock even went, finished their homework while they were asleep, anything like that? MDs, any outperforming moment? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Wait, what's going quiet? Yeah, I don't know. Nice, nice, 160. Get around the clock, guys. Anybody in the market class competition make that much or even higher? Anybody, anybody? I'll go. Um, I woke up early today. Awesome, 6 a.m. Never wake up that early. Anybody else wake up that early? Super not used to it? Awesome. Okay, now I'm going to pass it over to our Investing 101 with Nathan. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan Lada. I'm the Director of Investment Research for the Investment Society. So if you weren't at the last meeting, basically what that means is I'll be crafting these presentations. Uh, they're going to be uh, kind of tailored to different topics. So for this one, Investing 101, back to the basics. What's a stock? What's a bond? How do you interpret these things? What are the indexes? Different kinds of markets? Things like that. I do have Luke Younger and Sebastian as well. Uh, they're two of my two associates. They help me craft the presentation. At the end of the presentation, you will see a QR code. One is for feedback. The other will be to come and be an associate as well. Uh, we're opening a third associate position. So if you are interested in being part of the design process and creativity, even coming up with some topics, uh, make sure you scan that QR code when it comes up. So firstly, we just have our quote of the day, kind of a funny quote, but I think we can all experience it. Uh, the 50-50 naughty rule. Anytime you have a chance, anytime you have a 50-50 chance of getting something right, there's a 90% probability you'll get it wrong. Like flipping a coin, everyone tries flipping a coin and you get it wrong a bunch, right? So it's just saying, you know, mo most of the time you might get it wrong. All right, so investing 101. So just a little bit of our content overview. We're gonna be going over securities, stocks, Bonds, alternative investments, which will be covered by Sebastian, market health, investment philosophy, current events, and feedback. And investment philosophy will be by Luke. So if y'all could scan this QR code, we're gonna try to make this presentation as interactive as possible, just so that we can be on the same page here. This QR code is what is investing to you. So it will take us to a word, which Sebastian will pull up now, as well as giving you one word that describes investing to you. We'll give you all a couple of seconds to do that, just so we can kind of gauge what we're all at. I'll just make sure you skip it so it doesn't make you register for the website. Everyone get it? Yeah. 
Can you go back? Oh, yeah. Just a couple more seconds on that. Begin. Yeah. All right, so all the words we wrote, uh, based on how many people put that specific word, see if we get some more results. And so growth and money are the two biggest things. Uh, money, obviously a big one, you got to put money in to get something back. And growth, growing your portfolio, growing what you're holding shares in, bonds, anything like that. I see gambling in there. We will talk about that. This is not gambling. Uh, you will not be learning how to gamble in this uh, investment society. Analysis, generational, creating, stocks, feature. These are all great, great words. Risk adjusted. Someone knows a little bit more about stocks and investing. All right. So that was just a quick thing to gauge where y'all are at, where everybody's at. Uh, hopefully that kind of gives us a better idea. We'll definitely look at that from the future uh, presentations. So first, we're going to be going over security. So does anyone know, just shout it out, what a security is? You don't have to raise your hand. Just kind of shout it out. Trying to make this as engaging as possible. Stock. A stock? Okay, that's an example of security. That's good. Anybody else? Maybe one more person. Shout it out. Juan. Juan? Okay, thank you. So what is a security? The def definition of a security is a fungible, negotiable financial instrument that represents some sort of financial value, usually in the form of stocks and bonds. So as we heard, stocks and bonds are definitely some great examples of a security, as well as derivatives and anything you know what a CCD is, just really quick. If not, that's okay. It's a little bit more uncommon. It's basically just the type of savings, but you have to leave the savings in there for the entire period of time. And they do pay a little bit higher interest rates than savings accounts. That's only to make up for the liquidity. Remember, in a savings account, you kind of pull money as much as you want in a CD, it has to stay there. Uh, and then an important note, all securities are stocks, but all stocks are not securities. So when you hear the word security, it can be any of the things listed on this little graphic we have here. Uh, some examples of crypto would be anything like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Those are major ones. Stocks can comprise of things like Apple, Tesla, Microsoft. And we'll get into that later. Uh, bonds. So you have corporate bonds, municipal bonds, government bonds, and then mutual funds. So has anyone heard of Berkshire Hathaway? Just raise your hand if you have. Yeah, pretty good amount. Um, a mutual fund is basically where you put your investment into a pool of money and then an external source will manage that money. So a professional money manager. I personally use Schwab. I use their mutual funds uh, and there's plenty of them to go around. Uh, securities can also be divided into asset classes. So when you look at these, you have cash and cash equivalents, you have fixed income, real estate, which is also considered an alternative. You have equities and commodities. So equity, like it sounds, you are taking in the company. You have shares of that company. Um, so and examples of those can be stocks, dividends, and they are some of the more volatile ones compared to cash and cash equivalents, as well as fixed income. When we look at cash, we're looking at the most liquid asset possible. If you have $5, it's not going anywhere, right? There's no risk in you holding onto this besides inflation, um, but you have the $5, right? So there's low risk, meaning there's a low return. A general rule of thumb to follow is high risk, high reward, low risk, low reward. And then we're also gonna be looking at fixed income, which where you lend money to an entity, and then they pay you a fixed amount in return until that maturity date. So things like bonds, like we heard earlier as an example. So now we'll get into the actual topics, which are stocks are going to be first. So what is a stock? Just anybody shout out an example, definition, anything you want. Partial ownership of a company. Can anyone name a stock? Random stock. Apple, one more? Tesla. Tesla, thank you. So a stock, simply put, uh, a type of security that represents ownership of a fraction of the issuing corporation. All that means is you are partaking or getting into a company. When you buy Apple shares, you're not buying all of Apple. You're buying a fraction of Apple. And there's many ways that you can buy portions of a share, fractions of a share, fraction of a fraction. You can invest lots of different ways. Uh, quick market insights of today. You can see anything in green was trending up, anything in, in red was trending down. Um, Apple, Tesla, Disney, all these companies. Does anybody know what NVO is? No? So NVO is Nova Works. They're actually owners and developers of Ozempic, a very popular weight loss drug. Um, and their market cap, they're the largest company in Denmark, but their market cap is actually larger than that of Denmark. So they make more money. Uh, as one entity than Denmark does as a country, which is an interesting fact. Um, and then we have Apple XPO was actually, I believe, the top earner of today in terms of uh, straight monetary change. 
So they gain uh, $18.49, which is a pretty big jump. When you see a jump like that, it could potentially mean that one, there was big news that day, so something massive happened, or they're a very volatile stock. As you see on the INSP, which is Inspire uh, Medical Systems, uh, they're not a super huge company, but you saw they lost $23 in stock value, meaning they are one of the more volatile stocks. And then we have Bank of America, Novo Nordisk, and Moderna of the vaccine company. So another slide on stocks, there are different kinds of stocks. So the first thing to note is dividends. Not all stocks pay dividends, which is important to note, only certain stocks. Uh, dividends simply put are the distribution of a company's earnings to its shareholders. So the companies can be distributed quarterly or paid as cash or additional stock. Whatever it is, it's considered a dividend. When we move to growth stocks, they do not pay dividends, right? So a good example is Tesla. Tesla simply in reinvests the retained earnings back into the company, meaning you get more stock. Uh, value stocks, put simply, are they trade for a cheaper price, but don't reflect its true value. So when you hear the terms undervalued, overvalued, those are the kind of things to look out for. And when you hear value stock, it simply means it's trading below what people think it should be worth. And then just to open any question, right? So if I invested at Apple at the beginning of the month, how much money would I have made? So Luke, do you want to just quickly? Mm -hmm. That one question, explain how you got it. I got it. So in the simplest way to put it is just go into Yahoo Finance, look at the stock in question. Uh, look at the stock in question. You can view the timeline, view specific dates, look at the closing uh, price and compare it to the beginning of the month closing price versus the current closing price. So you would have made a crisp $5 bill if you invested seven days ago. <laughs> Thanks. So moving on, now we're gonna go in depth about growth and value stocks. So obviously that's two different things that each come with their pros and cons. <clears throat> For growth stocks will be on the left side, value stocks will be on the right. So growth stock, first it's gonna have a high rate of return, but that could be a sign that it's a volatile stock as we saw with the Inspire uh, Medical. So high rate of return, right? A growth stock often has a high rate of return as a long-term investment option. Something important to note as a growth stock, as it said at the bottom, it's not meant for short term. A growth stock is a company that you're going to hope grows to a massive level, maybe not a level of Disney, but it's, you want it to grow to a certain extent. So if you invest in a growth stock for like a week or five days, you're not really going to get anything out of it. In fact, you might lose more than you put in, only because the company is growing, it's trying to mature, and it's trying to build up its foothold within the market. However, growth stocks are usually market leaders. So as we saw in the previous slide with the little market insights, the company that made $18, that was the market leader for today. But maybe none of y'all heard of that company. It's not really well established. It will be more volatile than other companies. And as it said, high risk. So just because it has a high rate of return usually correlates with high risk. Um, some investors don't want uh, any risk in their portfolio, which is obviously impossible. So they aim for as low risk as possible. That means they might want to stay away from these growth stocks because as companies are maturing, as they're building up their wealth, as they're building up their market cap, they're going to be a little bit more volatile. So if you don't want a lot of risk, it might be smart to avoid a growth stock. Then we have value stock on the right. Uh, value stock has low entry point. So anybody can invest in a value stock, right? Like I said, you can buy shares of a share, you can buy full shares, you can buy as many things as you want. But patience is key. As it says later, uh, they do have high dividends, right? they will be the ones to pay you back and the growth stocks will not. But that's only because they can't offer you that high growth of a growth stock. So a growth stock, right? You want it to grow, you want it to mature into this well-established company. A value stock, it's already established. It can't really go much higher than it already is. So they offset that by paying dividends. They pay you as sort of a reward for investing in the company rather than waiting for it to grow. And as it says, stability. Because, they're, uh, because they pay dividends, because they can't really grow that much, uh, you expect them not to crash that much, right? That's where a little bit of market volatility comes in. Anything can happen on any given day, a major news story, right? For the most part, they are pretty stable and usually are established companies. And if you all have any questions on any point, feel free to ask. Um, like I said, make it more engaging. You can raise your hand and I'll call on you anytime. So quick quiz. Does anybody know which stock had the highest market cap of last year in the U.S.? Was it a tech stock? Yes, it was a tech stock. Apple. Apple, who said Apple? Right, all the way back there, it was Apple. Does anybody know what stock currently has the highest market cap? 
they just passed Apple. They're currently in first place, and Apple is actually right below them. Microsoft, Microsoft there we go. So as we see on this slide here, uh, Apple had the highest market cap last year, and it closed, and we're a little bit, we're in February, but it closed at about, I would say, 2.8-ish trillion, right? And you can see, oh, it's actually down there, 2.99 trillion. So that was a 44.87% change year over year from 2022 to 2023. And it's actually down 2.3% going into this year. And as we can see with Microsoft, it's currently at 3.077 trillion. So they're right there neck and neck, but Microsoft is trending up. They are obviously past them. And as you can see, it's about a 5% difference. So it might not sound like a lot, but when it comes to these major corporations, 5% does tend to add up over time. Our third topic that we have is bonds. So bonds, what are they? Uh, bonds simply put are a borrowing arrangement through which the borrower issues or sells an IA to the investor. So can anyone name an example or a type of bond off the top of their head? Government. Government? What did you say back there? Treasury. Treasury bond. Perfect. So those are some good examples, right? Why do companies issue bonds? Well, they can issue them for many reasons. Um, they can try to be funding their company. So it's a way to uh, give an incentive for the person to buy into the company without actually giving up any equity of that company. So fund capital improvements, uh, expansion, debt refinancing, or acquisitions, right? Why are they important for you to have in a portfolio? Well, you can't just keep all your money in stocks. You can, but that's very easy. You want to diversify your business. Later on, in a couple of weeks, we're going to actually do a presentation focusing on diversification. It's important that you make sure your money isn't centered in one space. Even within stocks and bonds, you can be too centered, right? So, like the airlines, if we go to what happened with uh, Boeing and JetBlue, there was a merger with JetBlue and another company with Boeing, with their airlines not really doing as well. If you're primarily invested in these airplanes or airline stocks, those stocks are going to tank, right? Because your whole portfolio is, if it's centered around there, it's going to come down. So, let's say you have stocks in tech, uh, planes, food, resources, and then you also have bonds, you're spreading out the risk. The chances of everything crashing at the same time is pretty low. And these are just different types of bonds. So the most common ones are treasury bonds, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, corporate bonds are not common, but they're interesting. And then we have high-yield bonds and then government bonds. So government bonds are generally considered a safe haven for investors. That also means they're going to come with the least amount of return on your investment. Uh, government bonds, the government will always be around, and if it doesn't, then we're just screwed anyway. So the government will generally never default on their bonds. Uh, agency bonds are considered just slightly more risky than government bonds. Uh, they do offer a little bit more of a return, but they must be issued by U.S. government-sponsored entities. Uh, then we have non-U.S. developed market bonds. So it's things like uh, bonds from other countries. So if you want to look into that, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, they are kind of dangerous to invest in if you don't really know what you're doing. Uh, corporate bonds. Does anybody know the only two remaining triple A bonds? So triple A is a rating. Does anybody know the only two triple A corporate bonds left in the U.S.? If not, that's okay. It's kind of a rare fact. Uh, one of them is not Apple. No. So, uh, no, not the U.S., but a corporate bond is like a major company. So try thinking of like, what was the, who currently has the highest market cap in the U.S. right now? Microsoft. So that's one of them, right? The other one is Johnson & Johnson. Uh, there used to be a lot more AAA bonds within the U.S., but they all got downgraded due to various reasons. Uh, rating agencies kind of base it off of earnings growth, profit margins, future outlook, and trends in the general company. So there's only two left in the entire U.S. Uh, then we have bank loans, which are considered higher up in risk because of uh, credit default capital structure. When a bank kind of liquidates, uh, debt holders are paid before equity holders. So the contract agreement is the forced liquidation of assets and the bonds would kind of go away. Um, emerging market, high interest rate, high currency movement, high potential for default. As you can see, we're climbing up. I keep saying high risk because it gets higher as we go up the chart. And then high yield bonds. So you might have heard of high yield bonds before, also known as junk bonds, right? Junk bonds are, they can be from anywhere really, but they are going to offer exponentially higher returns than any other bond on this pyramid. The side effect of that, very high risk. Um, during a recession, any kind of recession, the uh, junk bonds are the first ones to go. So if you invest in junk bonds, sure, you, may, might, you might make a lot of money, but as soon as the economy turns bad, you've lost all your money. It's all gone. Uh, this is just a quick example of bond ratings. So we have Moody's, S&P, and Fitch, the three top rating agencies in the US. 
Um, the triple A bonds are obviously at the top. Anything down to a triple B minus, anything below that, you kind of get into the junk bond area. I know it's a speculative and highly speculative, but in reality, those are very, very risky in general. Um, most investors really don't invest below a triple B plus. Uh, that's for personal reasons. But if we look here, uh, examples of a triple A bond would be the treasury yield. And like I said, triple B minus and lower, really high yield, but also a pretty high risk of default. And then just a quick thing on maturity, uh, the issuer pays back the initial principal, which is what you put down after a set of time. Uh, the most common are five, 10 and 30 year bonds. So now we're going to move into alternatives, which is gonna be presented by Sebastian. All right, so most some of you guys know me and some of you guys know, but if you don't, my name is Sebastian. I'm one of the junior analysts. Uh, getting started, I'm gonna cover uh, quite a bit. I'm gonna try to consolidate it and make it as concise as possible because there's a lot that goes into alternative investments. There's home markets and you know they're very established already uh, for many years now. So the first one that many hear of um, is private equity. And that is essentially just acquiring companies uh, and that can be public firms and turning them into private firms because you basically buy all the whole company and also and remove the stock from the stock exchange. Um, and I'll talk to you later about what the descriptions of some of these companies and what they do. The next one, of course, real estate. I know we have a lot of real estate people here up at the top. Uh, purchasing, owning, renting, selling land and buildings for profit. Uh, a lot of it you can also think of it is if you own property, you're getting an, uh, uh, an NOI, I'm sorry, an ROI, return on investment, um, and NOI, which is, you know, your your net operating income, which is essentially the, the revenues you get from owning and operating that building from like leases and stuff like that. So the other, the other thing is venture capital. That's something that's uh, usually associated with being very high risk, uh, high risk, high reward. You know, Shark Tank, that's the most traditional and probably the most popular one that everyone knows and sees, where essentially you're going out looking for high growth opportunities in these very, you know, uh, startup companies. That, and usually the most common types are like biotech, tech. Now you're seeing a lot of AI and stuff. So those are just some examples to give you a reference. Uh, you also have private debt. Now, private debt is pretty interesting because it's essentially you're just loaning to people you could literally loan to your neighbor across the street um and it's not through public channels which is like you know the exchanges or any of the you know marketplaces that you can go to and actually do that kind of lending um the the caveat of that is that it usually has very high rates um and that's because it usually higher risk your neighbor might not pay you back for a plethora of reasons and, and, you know, you're not going to the bank or any of the others, any of these other institutions that can like vet you as like a creditor and like get your, you know, credit, you know, profile and whatnot. So there's a lot of risk with that. Um, hedge funds. So hedge funds, pretty complex. Uh, it's very complex that I think we'll touch on it maybe later when we talk about things like derivatives and stuff. Um, so they utilize a lot of diverse investment strategies, long and short positions, like I said, derivatives. Um, and they, I'm sorry, I spelled that wrong. They, uh, and they leverage to generate returns leverage. Basically, if, you know, I can multiply the, you know, returns I get, if I have someone spending, you know, an extra $10 for every $1 I have, you know, if it's going to be a 10% increase, that means I'm getting that much higher because there's just more, you know, uh, being put in. And usually that can come, you know, with like other lenders and stuff, banks and stuff can do that. Uh, complicated. We'll touch on that later. Uh, real assets. These are tangible assets. This is another category that it's uh, talked about, not, not not talked about too much. Uh, so this land, real estate, commodities, infrastructure, collectibles, art, you know, art is one of them. You know, you have architectural objects, archaeological objects, you know, stuff like that. That actually has, and that is a form of investment, believe it or not. Obviously, you have people with top dollar that were willing to pay quite a lot for those things. Uh, currency is the last one and probably the craziest one because it is very, very volatile. Uh, and it's, you know, a, it's, anything can change it. Everything from geopolitical events to, you know, uh, economic events that are happening around the world. Um, so it, it, it's very volatile and it requires a lot of keen insight into monitoring, you know, what's going on in the world, stuff like that that can be easily altered. Uh, and also you have to deal with exchange rates, right? So it's just... 
And essentially, all you're doing is trading and holding foreign currencies, capitalizing on the fluctuating exchange rates. So um, it can be pretty complicated. We'll touch on that later. Uh, but uh, And so just to clarify all this, each one of these are very highly specialized. There's people that specialize in all of these different categories. And, you know, they almost have markets within their themselves. They've, you know, become very well established. And so it's not like anyone with a finance major coming out of college can do this. You literally specialize in these things. And this is what you do all day. And, you know, they, they have this too in like many of the bank, many of the Wall Street firms, you know, they have people that specialize in just, you know, derivatives and, you know, things like that. So it's, it can be very specialized. So, I'll go a little bit over some of the purposes and strategies behind this. Luke is going to talk more about investment philosophy and strategy, but these are just the most common principles that you see when people are investing in these um, assets here. And so one of the, you know, probably the most common one that you hear is diversification, low correlation with things like the stock market or the bond market reduce, and it reduces your overall portfolio risk. So it's just really talking about, you know, can I, in certain economic conditions, I'm sorry, in market conditions, what will my returns be during those conditions? Can it basically beat, let's say, the S&P or a different index? And that's usually why sometimes I diversify. And it can also, in some of these cases, you have, uh, in, it can be inflation proof and, and, uh, and things of that nature. So higher return potential, private equity is one, venture capital you can really easily, you know, in a, a few years or long term, these are also more, a lot of these are long term uh, uh, strategies and stuff, stuff like real estate, private equity and venture capital, those things take a long time before they're ready to really flourish, and then you're ready to cash out. So that just take that into account. You also have risk management, that's a very common, you know, um, that kind of goes along with diversification, but it's really just, you know, it's just managing how much risk you have. And you can combat things, uh, strategies include derivatives, short selling. Some of these derivatives have automatic short, se short selling mechanisms where if something occurs, it'll automatically short sell a certain stock or you know, uh, array of stocks and stuff. So it can be pretty complex. Um, and then of course you have just unique opportunities, startups, direct investment, special funds that you don't necessarily have access to, that the public doesn't have access to. And also they're not as regulated so there's that caveat. So you do have to be diligent and careful because some, not everybody's ethical. So that and we're actually thinking about talking about that later in the semester. We'll talk maybe about ethics and just because it's an important topic that I don't think it's covered. We don't think it's covered enough. Um, another thing is just hedging against inflation. Real estate is great for that. Real assets too. Um, if the if inflation occurs, you're not going to necessarily lose the value of that uh, that asset if you still own it. And so it's a good way of preserving the purchase power. I'm sorry, preserving the purchase power of that asset. And you're not losing all your capital, basically, because your dollar is worth less today, has less purchasing power today than it did yesterday. Well, you can go into things like real estate and real assets to protect against that. Um, of course, capital preservation, it's kind of similar to what I said before. You're just talking about uh, things like uh, private loans, private debt are good at that because you're just Basically, you're you're collecting income from the interest rates of you know lending out that money, but you're protecting the principal, the original amount that you lent out, and so it's it's one way. It's low low volatility, and it's just a steady income stream. People who want alternative sources of income will use that. Uh, so, like I said, uh, I just mentioned income streams. So you know, real estate, like I said, you correct rents, leases, you know, stuff like that. Steady income stream. And then last but not least, your performance of your portfolio. Um, overall, it can enhance your portfolio returns, um, but that is, and the portfolio returns are specifically when it's adjusted to risk. So you're gonna see a lot of the most, you know, smartest investors and whatnot, Warren Buffett, guys like Bill Gates. Bill Gates is, believe it or not, the largest landowner in the United States. And the reason is for that is, he understands that there's a lot of things humans can produce, but the one thing we can't produce is more land. So as more and more land gets cultivated and we start acquiring that land, well, it's a supply and demand function. The more you know, supply shrinks and demand either stays the same or increases, well, the value is going to go up because 
And the problem is there's not enough supply there to meet it. So it's going to cause an increase, uh, an increase in value over time of that asset, which is land, real estate, et cetera. So just, just an example like that. Um, one thing I'll leave you with too, Warren Buffett uh, said, he has a very famous quote, um, and it's basically where he says, the stock market is essentially a, is a, is a mechanism of transferring money from the patient to the inpatient. And so just leave you guys with that. A lot of this that we're going to talk about throughout the semester is just about patients. Um, the patient ones are usually the ones that come out on top. And so I would listen to that advice. And Luke's standing here. He's going to talk more about that and you know, elaborate. So I'm going to give it over to Luke. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, So I was going to say one more quick thing before Luke about market health. So just really quick, market health. Um, so we're going to talk about some indicators, lagging versus meeting, those kind of topics. So first, GDP. What is GDP? Uh, in simple, it measures the total value of all goods and services produced in the U.S. and reflects consumption in the public and private sectors. So GDP, there's gross, net, domestic, foreign, all kinds of GDP. Uh, some key indicators that most investors and economists look at when predicting the health of the market are the Dow, NASDAQ, S&P 500, and each of these indexes provide historical confidence that reflect investor, or historical data that reflects investor confidence. So first, lagging. A lagging indicator is used to confirm a market change. Lagging means there's historical data reference that you can use to confirm what you thought was happening in the past in that time period. So examples of that, unemployment rate, uh, corporate profits, and inflation. When a company puts out their quarterly report, so Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, um, each of those reflects what happened in the past. It tells you what happened during that time period. It tells you how much money they made, where the money went, all those kinds of things, right? Uh, the employment rate. The jobs report came out Friday, I believe February 2nd. And so it comes with all the numbers. Employment rate, uh, specifically how many people got jobs, how many people lost jobs, how many people became employed, unemployed, all those kinds of numbers, right? That tells you what happened in the past. It's, con it's confirming a historical data. Leading indicator is used to predict an occurrence in the market. So an example, just a quick one, is uh, customer engagement metrics. If people are going out and buying lots of product, buying more things, maybe new houses, things like that, um, that's a leading indicator because the market is trending up, right? You can see people doing that in real time. You personally cannot track a company's uh, like total earnings without waiting until the quarterly report comes out. You can see the reflection of people buying different products, people buying all these kinds of things. Um, really quick about markets. So we'll start off with the NASDAQ. There's primarily four that investors look at. Uh, there's plenty more. And the Dow is kind of becoming not so looked at when it comes to investing. Uh, but to start off, the NASDAQ. So NASDAQ contains more than 3,000 stocks, primarily technological. Uh, it's also important to note that a stock can be a part of multiple things, like listed under multiple things. Uh, so the S&P 500, collection of the 500 largest stocks, which are issued by 500 large cap companies. Does anybody know what large cap means? Or how much money does a company need in market cap to be considered a large cap company? Over 10 billion. Over 10 billion, that's the right answer. So does anyone know what a small cap company is? Anyone know what that range is? If not, that's okay. A small cap range is anywhere from 250 million to 2 billion. Uh, so obviously anything in between that is considered mid cap. So the small cap, mid cap, large cap, a lot of them. And the Russell 2000 tracks 2000 small cap companies. And like I said, we have the Dow Jones, uh, which consists of 30 blue chip industrial and financial companies in the U.S. Blue chip simply means that it's uh, well-established corporations that have a really, really, really high market value. So next up, we have a quick quiz. Uh, you're going to work with the person next to you just for a couple minutes. Uh, and we're going to quiz you on what are these. So are these leading or are these lagging? And we're going to get you all to answer as well. So increase in building permit, a decline in consumer sentiment, rising unemployment rates, and certain corporate profit. So remember what I kind of explained on the last slide. Turn to the person next to you. I'm going to give you all until 823, and then I'll call on you all to announce some of the answers. All right. So it is 823. So we're trying to wrap up your discussion on whatever you thought was lagging or leading. Uh, we'll review the answers to you. I believe they're all going to, they're either going to show up separate or they're going to show up together. We're going to find out together. So for increase in building permits, 
Raise your hand if you thought it was a leading indicator. Leading for the first one and lagging for the first one. We thought it was lagging. Got two over there. Okay, so hopefully it's one by one. Oh, okay. It is a leading indicator. There we go. Uh, because it can signal a rise in future construction activity and may suggest a growing economy. It's important to note that you can kind of interpret, it, uh, interpret these either way. If you start overthinking it, you're probably going to get it wrong. So it's best to just read it at face value. Um, like I mentioned in the last one, a leading indicator, you can see people buying these things in real time. If you see neighborhoods getting constructed, if you see uh, you go to a construction store, you might something stuff getting sold out, right? People are tending to buy these kinds of items. Uh, next, decline in consumer sentiment. Leading, raise your hand. Lagging, raise your hand. Okay, about 50 50 on that one. Uh, that one is actually a leading indicator again because it can indicate a pending decrease in consumer spending. Consumer sentiment is basically people's willingness to go out and buy items, buy goods and services. So if people are less willing to buy that, you can see that in real time. You can experience it in real time. If you're if you're buying less stuff, your family's buying less stuff, your people around you, you can kind of see it in real time that that'll be a leading indicator. So it's indicating that there could be a decrease in consumer spending overall. Uh, rising unemployment rates, leading indicator. Lagging indicator. Perfect. It is a lagging indicator because it can signal an economic downturn. And as I said with the jobs report, it's referring to previous data. It's referring to something that already came out, historically accurate, and it's confirming what happened in the past. Last one, surging corporate profits. Leading or lagging? Leading, lagging, lagging. That's perfect. Like I said, when quarterly reports come out, it's referring to historical data. So it reflects positive economic growth has taken place. Probably should have mixed those up better. That's okay. Uh, last topic we have is investment philosophy presented by Luke. All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Luke Younger. I'm a sophomore finance major and I'm a associate director of investment research. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about investment philosophy. Uh, today's topic is going to be personal investment philosophy and strategy with a focus on individual investments in uh, retirement funds and ETFs. So there's a couple of questions I want you to be asking yourselves along the presentation. What attracted you to present uh, investing? Why do you invest? And why should you invest? If anyone wants to answer that out loud, feel free. Just shout it out. Yes, that's exactly what I want y'all said. So essentially, the most basic goal of investing is money. You want to make a return higher than what you put in. So our brief little overview, uh, we're going to be going over our goal. Uh, I'm going to be describing our goal, like how we're going to achieve it. We're going to look at our risk tolerance based on our goal. I want to try and set some expectation management for all of y'all uh, for when it comes to like life and investing in general. And then we're going to cover uh, commitment, how to stay committed and how to um, just, yeah, just stay committed. Really. And then we're going to end with a brief conclusion. So goals, what do you need to fund? There are different investment goals and different strategies for each goal. Um, when you're investing, essentially what you're trying to do is finance a future endeavor or a future liability, uh, such as a retirement, uh, you're trying to finance or fund a house or a college fund. Today's focus is on retirement. We're trying to fund a future without work. How are we going to... How are we going to do this? How are we going to not work and live? So there's a couple of rules. If you look, if you look it up on Google, there's a couple of rules you'll get. You'll get the 80% rule, which is one year of retirement. You should be able to live off 80% of your current salary. And there's also the 15% rule, which states uh, try and invest 15% of your annual salary for your retirement. I don't really like either of these rules because everyone's situation and wants and desires are so radically different that no one rule can apply to everybody. So my most basic re recommendation would be try to figure out what your needs and desires are. And because most of us, like if you start investing early and young, you should be able to meet those uh, needs and desires. So first thing or next thing is our risk tolerance. What is your tolerance? Some of y'all, or not some of y'all, some people may be degenerate gamblers who love risk. Others have a lower risk appetite. They might avoid roller coasters and hate fun things. 
But for things to consider for our uh, risk tolerance, for our goal, our goal is to build a retirement fund. This is our livelihood. We can't be assuming too much risk when we're trying to build a fund because like you would be, if this fund evaporates into nothing and you're taking on too much risk, it'd be horrible for you. You probably, probably wouldn't want to keep going. But um, so this, our goal, the nature of our goal is a risk lowering factor. You don't want to assume too much risk because of the nature of our goal. Uh, the next thing to consider when looking at your risk tolerance is the length of investment. We are all young bucks, relatively far from retiring. Um, most of y'all haven't even started working. So we're looking at 25 to 45 years of investing or holding our position. This is a long-term investment horizon. I use that term because I've heard that Professor Sweet really enjoys that term. So I try to please the audience a little bit. So because of the length of our investment and the amount of time we'll be in this position, this is actually a risk increasing factor. We're able to take on more risk due to our ability to recover from any significant losses with our long position. So the last thing we should really consider is our financial situation. What is our income? Not looking good, guys. It's not looking good. It is, it's pretty low. However, it should increase after we graduate and typically our income increases as our career uh, progresses. When you're looking at your financial situation, you wanna see how much would it hit in this account affect me personally? How likely am I to withdraw from this account? When you're looking at a retirement fund, the likelihood of withdrawing is very low. This is one of the last things you wanna dip into if you're in need. And a hit in your retirement account, like a temporary lull in the market shouldn't be affecting your livelihood as it's not like a primary funding for the now. It's a future fund. All right, moving on. Or actually, uh, with all these in mind, we get to uh, the conclusion of a moderate risk level, not to be confused with new normal. All right, so expectation management. This is the ugly truth, guys. I'm sorry, I don't wanna tell you this. It hurt me when I heard it. But investing is a powerful tool, it is not magic. It isn't going to make you rich overnight. It's not even gonna make you rich like within a couple of years, unless you're like, I don't know. So something I wanna warn you about is a growing trend in the gamification of investing. In culture, especially within uh, Wall Street bets, not even just in culture, in advertising too, you'll see Robinhood and certain other uh, investment softwares they're trying to advertise high-risk trades, like high-risk option trades. They want you to go and donate to hedge funds. Like, this is not investing. Investing isn't a game. It's not even fun. It can be fun, but it's not supposed to be fun, especially with our goal of the retirement fund. So I'm just trying to warn you all of uh, trying to be, make it a game or anything fun. So the next step, and the next thing to consider to manage expectations is you aren't better than the market. Probably. You probably are not better than the market. If you look at investor returns for equity funds versus the S&P 500, and these are professional investors, the investor returns consistently and significantly underperform as compared to the market. Everything, every opportunity you want to consider or you want to pursue not every opportunity, I shouldn't say that. Most, the majority of opportunities, especially for the inexperienced investor, it's priced in. They know better than you, it's already priced in. There's no opportunity there, it's already been seized. So the conclusion I want you to derive from this is that you fuel your own savings with your, or you fuel your own returns with your savings and active incomes. You, like you're not gonna get a Lamborghini with your salary now within two years, you're gonna get what you give. So I know I hate to say it, I don't enjoy saying it to y'all. I don't enjoy this news. I just want y'all to know that this is very disappointing. And the Lambo is still pretty good ways away. All right, the final thing I wanna cover 
is commitment. So hopefully in the future, once you get your degree, you'll be able to get uh, some good employment, some employers that offer benefits. You, and which the first thing you're gonna do is utilize your employer contributions. You are gonna choose a 401k or an IRA, and you're gonna try and maximize uh, your contributions into these accounts because these accounts offer benefits that can't be seen just normal um, ETFs and normal market accounts. They offer tax benefits. So you really wanna utilize, uh, you really wanna utilize these employee benefits. One, if you're like that and you're able to maximize your contributions, you still have money left over, you're like, what do I do with this? The next thing I recommend doing is investing in ETFs. Uh, Vanguard has a lot of great funds. And so that's where you wanna put your money after you utilize that. Uh, the next thing, you want to remain stoic and have no emotions when, you, when investing like that gentleman right there. When you're investing, investing and emotions are like oil and water. They do not mix. You want to try to avoid any feelings you have about your fund and have confidence in your strategy. A little fact to kind of calm your nerves and keep you uh, holding strong is there's no 15-year window in the market that has not guaranteed profits. If you were to invest at the very peak before the crash in 2008, you'd be sitting at a pretty pretty good sum in 2023. There is not a 15 year window where you invest and then you're down. Uh, investing should be a core part of your finances. Invest regularly and try to ignore market trends. Do not try to time the market. It's, it's gonna be a waste of time and effort. You're gonna worry yourself just Invest as often as you can and as much as you can. The final thing, do not touch this money. Don't even look at it. Now, obviously, this is a little dramatic. You need to keep an eye on your money. But you need to remember, you are in this for the long run. You, I recommend quarterly or semi-quarterly uh, check-ins. You don't want to be worrying yourself with the day-to-day -day lulls or rises in the market. So stay strong. Uh, diamond hands or HODL, if any of you have heard of that, hold on for dear life. All right, for a conclusion, I want you to look at the process we used to arrive at the strategy. This is one of the most basic outlines of what to consider when investing. Investing in retirement funds, ETFs, is a great way to build one's uh, financial security and wealth. Uh, and invest despite the harsh reality I presented to y'all. It is still a strong tool. It isn't magic, but it's a very strong tool. Now I'm gonna open the floor for questions. If anyone has any. Sounds good. All right, moving on. All right, so we're just gonna wrap it up with some current events that happened uh, January, February, just getting in there, current events. Um, does anybody know about the S&P record high? Who, knows, who has heard that S&P hit a record high, I believe, last week? Yeah, There's a couple people. So why is this significant? Uh, this can actually happen on the same day as the jobs report, I believe. So in the jobs report, uh, you can look up the jobs report on Bureau of Labor Statistics. Anyone can open it, public access. Um, 353,000 jobs were added in the month of January. It's a pretty big number. Usually it's only about 200,000, sometimes less than that, sometimes more. But that 353,000 is a massive gain of jobs. Um, I would suggest looking at it. It just came out. And like I said, anybody can look at it. And just a quick note, that also resu resulted in oil coming down just a little bit. Uh, then we have bonds. So if you look at those massive jumps in bond, uh, that's the bond yield graph right there. So bonds jumped up 17 points on the big one. And I think the, as the smaller ones obviously jumped a little bit smaller. But simply put, that just means that People are confident that the Fed will not cut interest rates in the near future. So obviously, when it comes to things like that, near can kind of mean anything. Um, but a lot of investors and in articles that I've read recently suggest that rates won't be talked about or looked at again until May. Then Chipotle. So I don't know if y'all saw it today, but Chipotle was the highest uh, dollar earner or grower on the market today. It raised its stock price by $179 which is an insane amount of growth. Uh, coincidentally, the job report just so happened to come out today, their quarterly report. Uh, so Q4 came out. Uh, they opened about 121 new locations across the country, which sounds like a dumb fact, but obviously it worked. 
Uh, it was the top earning stock of the day, like I said. Uh, from a year ago today, the company has grown 54%. So that's huge. That's a massive growth. Companies don't do that. Like we talked about you know, a couple slides before, growth versus value. This is one of those times where a stock just blew up. You know, a quarterly report came out, people felt confident, and they invested in it. So a good time to invest would have been this morning. So then we have sports entertainment. Who watches sports here? Everybody, right? Well, most people. Okay. Uh, so people know major companies like Disney, Warner Brothers, and Fox. So I don't know if y'all heard about it, but there was a story that came out, articles came out that Disney, Warner Brothers, and Fox are combining to have some sort of media TV deal for ESPN, for the NBA, for the NFL. Uh, another report came out today saying the NFL and NBA had no clue this was happening. This merger was, or not merger, but this kind of package deal was going on behind the scenes and the big sporting companies were kind of blindsided by this. So Disney owns ESPN. Warner Brothers owns TNT. So does anybody know the show Inside the NBA? I've heard of that kind of, yeah. So they're owned by Warner Brothers, which I just found out today. Uh, and then they're still trying to regulate contracts. So if we see on this next slide, uh, Disney, that big spike down there is only 1%. So Disney's a massive corporation. They can afford to take that hit. Um, if we look on the next slide here, Fox took a huge drop after this was announced uh, today and dropped 6%. And then Warner Brothers here, another massive fallout was 3%. So these companies, you know, they expected something better, but they all dropped. And that could just be a lack of confidence because it's not necessarily confirmed that these companies will be able to strike a deal with the NBA or with the NFL. The NBA has their contract agreements, so does the NFL. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, these could be some key companies to watch for in terms of growth or in terms of loss. Uh, that's pretty much it. Then we just have a feedback form here. So as I mentioned earlier, there is a position open, one more position for an associate. If you like what you saw, if you want to have input on what's being created, if you want to help us out with the form, that'll be on that side, on the associate form. Then we have a feedback form. I think it's anonymous. If it's not, I don't really care. I just want to know what y'all thought of the presentation. Was it too fast paced? Was it too slow paced? Uh, was the information we covered interesting to you? If not, what would you like to see? Some other topics that we have to keep in mind throughout the year, are careers in finance, right? So if you're a business major, if you're not a business major, you want to learn more about what you can do with your degree, we can cover that for you. We have a whole presentation that can be tailored to that specifically. Uh, things like value investing, futures, a very complex topic. We can try to break that down for you all. Uh, macro investing, uh, a whole presentation on the philosophy of investing. Uh, like Luke said, the percentage, finding what's right for you. Um, short selling, sovereign debt. So there's plenty of topics we can cover. You're more than welcome to give that feedback. If you have any questions about the presentation overall, uh, even questions about what we do for jobs, right? Most of us have had internships. We can give you a little bit more insight into that. If you have questions about the associate specifically, you're more than welcome to come down after the meeting. I can talk to you about that for sure. Um, that's all. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Sweet. We are going to have to miss out on the sweet spot, but be back next week. And we'll head on cover it. Here's a little sneak peek. Did y'all get that? Okay, so Market Watch updates. Uh, you can still sign up. QR code's up there. Password is invest. Here's from yesterday, our little leaderboard. We have Brayton Beam, Cyril Gonzalez, Hiram Lugo, Miguel Gutierrez, Camille Powell. Are any of them in here? Give some hands. Congrats. 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 Give a round of applause, kid. Awesome. And we do have a movie night tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. here in the MH building, 2.01.36. If y'all want to scan it, we are going to see the margin call. I've never seen that movie, so I'm going to, get, I'm going to bring my popcorn. We will have snacks for you guys as well if y'all show up. So 5.30, you know, if y'all need to leave early for class, go ahead. But if y'all if y'all want to scan it, go on RSVP. Thumbs up. Perfect. So I want to advertise again for first generation investors. If y'all are interested into tutoring high school students, um, either Tuesdays or Thursdays, two times for four weeks, going to their campus, uh, you will get community service hours, uh, essentially teaching them financial literacy. And then at the end of that course that you end up teaching them, they will get $100 that they can invest. And the curriculum is uh, already set, so you essentially just need to read and you know, kind of up to date uh, with the slides. 
we will, if you'll sign up, we are going to hold um, kind of like a tutoring session getting started next week on the 13th and 16th. Um, still movable days, kind of to get y'all prepared if y'all want to sign up. Put something on your resume, freshman sophomores, you know, announce it to a couple of your friends as well. And we are going to have an alumni panel discussion uh, rotated around fixed income on February 22nd. So we're gonna have three alumni panel, uh, three alumni coming down with us. We'll have Jason Lincoln, uh, Benjamin Warlow, and Carl Nelson. And you know, come meet them, join them. Uh, we're gonna have a moderator, ask them a bunch of questions, uh, dealing with their job. Um, how does it work? How, you know, what do you do to calm down after your day to day? And of course, they'll stick around after if y'all have any other questions. If you want to, you know, add them on LinkedIn, network with them, kind of say, how is it being a UTA State student in the past? Now, of course, RSVP, go ahead and RSVP on that. As well as if one of y'all are in, in, I forget what class it is, but if y'all need to take a CAP uh, course, this does give you CAP credit. So you just need to show up, we'll sign y'all in and we'll send it to your professors. As well as for, if, if y'all are interested in being an, an associate for the Director of Outreach, Investment public investment Research and Public Relations. For Investment Research, what Nathan and Luke Sebastian did, kind of just more art style uh, oriented, as well as Public Relations going on, we, dealing with the website, updating our website, you'll essentially be help, helping Adrian keep up to date, reach out to employers, um, things on that factor. For director of outreach, uh, helping Jada with socials, planning, um, if you want to talk goals, social. And then our merch, we do have a polls here today uh, on for sale for $25. And if you are a member, it will be $20. So go ahead and as well pay your dues. Come on down here. Uh, we're going to be out here for uh, 10, 15 minutes up till when we start getting ready to go to sleep. And for the member advisory board as well, we will take two fellow members for the member advisory board. Essentially, you know, bring them into helping out our MPs. If, if they're like, hey, I'm interested in, you know, become treasurer in one semester, two semesters from now, I kind of want to see like, what you do, what it involves, and things like that. If you want to also help uh, me, you know, contact employers, email, sending emails out, and things of that sort, you know, go ahead and scan that RVP, and we'll hold kind of a little basic interviews on the coming weeks. Here's our calendar, uh, movie night on the 8th. We did have to cancel our BP, British Petroleum event for the 16th. Uh, they ended up canceling, but that brought us an opportunity. They were willing to go to the, they have a Houston team uh, over there, essentially trading. So they wanted to come to our general meeting, kind of say what goes on in, um, in a trade with them, kind of a uh, day-to-day -day process our income panel on the 22nd. And I believe we will have SEC come over on the 21st, kind of a little snippet on our meeting as well. So be excited for that. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be down here. Go ahead and pay off your dues. If y'all like to buy some polos, you know, you can scan the QR code up for LinkedIn. You can either buy through our website, through LinkedIn, as well as we take Zelle and Cass. Thank you very much for coming. Hope y'all enjoyed. Be tuned in for next week.